So tonight, we travel into space, to realms that are replete with mystery, black holes. They are areas of space that exert a gravitational pull so intense that nothing, not even light, can escape from being swallowed. They distort time and space around them, and they come in different sizes, teeny weeny, middling, and massive, super massive. They've been likened to giant garbage disposals and long dark tunnels to nowhere. And there are curious terms associated with them. Spaghettification, singularity, dumb holes, and event horizon. I think all of our imaginations are spurred by black holes. Einstein predicted their existence, but we've never been able to actually see one. Our special guests, however, bring hope because they just might be able to show the world what a black hole really looks like. It's a privilege for us to present Shep Dolman and Katie Bauman together and here at the Museum of Science. So please join me in giving them a warm welcome. First up, Shep Dolman. Okay, well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, when I told my family that I was giving the talk here at the Museum of Science and I asked them if they wanted to go, my son said, of course, right? Because for him, this is ground zero, right? This is where all science began. This is where the T-Rex is, right? Uh, I'm a West Coast boy, so it's not uh, ground zero for me, but I, can, I know that people with children, this is where all the kids come to get their first real taste of science in the area. So it's a really special place. So it's wonderful for us to be here today to talk to you about a project that we are very passionate about. And uh, as, the introduction, as the introduction said, we are trying to do something that has never been done before. We're trying to see the unseeable. Uh, simply put, we're trying to create a new instrument that can see what a black hole looks like. And I think we all know what black holes are in some sense, right? They're gravity run amok. They're when matter gets so dense and there's so much of it that the force of gravity crushes it. There's no stiffness. There's no characteristic of the matter itself that can resist gravity. Everything gets compressed into a point, and there's a boundary around that point called the event horizon where the force of gravity is so strong that even light can't escape. So it's the ultimate cloaking device. It struggles not to be seen. And the Event Horizon Telescope project that we're going to talk to you about today is trying to do just that, to see the shadow of this black hole. And we hope to see something a little bit like uh, like this picture here, which the swirling gas around and this last orbit at which light can, can circularize around there. And if we could do this, if we could put high resolution binoculars on and see into the heart of a black hole, that is where we could test Einstein's theories. That's where Einstein's conce concept of gravity might break down. We know it works on solar system scales, but does it work at the boundary of a black hole? That's what we want to find out. So, to set things in context, I want to show you one of my favorite galaxies. Right? This is Centaurus A. It's one of the nearest you know, galaxies uh, in our area. And all the light you see there can be well understood. Most of this is all starlight. And there are some dust lanes going up and down here. But when you look at it in the radio, when you look at radio waves, you see something whoop, remarkably different. You see these bright jets of high-speed material streaming from the center of the galaxy. Now, this should terrify you, right? These are blowtorches that go tens of thousands of light years from the center of the galaxy. The amount of energy in these like, blowtorches, these relativistic jets of material, is equivalent to one supernova, one star exploding every single year at the center of this galaxy. So it's extraordinarily powerful. And the only thing that we know of that can power something like this is a spinning, supermassive black hole, a black hole that weighs millions or billions of times what our sun does, accreting matter and, officially, uh, and efficiently turning all of that uh, energy of the onrushing material into radiant light. 
And that's what you're seeing here. So we know that there's something really terrifying in the center of these galaxies, and black holes are really the only answer. So let's talk for a minute about how black holes got started. And you can't really talk about that without discussing Einstein. Uh, when Einstein came on the scene, there were mysteries, like the perihelion of Mercury. For some reason, the orbit of Mercury doesn't come back and close on itself. It processes. And nobody could figure out why that was. People had exotic constructs and exotic uh, explanations for that. And Einstein told us that gravity should be understood as a deformation in space-time. Instead of immediate action instantaneously between pieces of matter, he said matter deforms space-time and other bits of matter orbit in that warped space-time. Kind of a geometrical construct of how to understand gravity. And when he did this, he immediately explained this perihelion of Mercury problem. That was pretty amazing, right? So we have this new concept of how gravity works. And just the next year, this man, Carl Schwarzschild, did something with the Einstein's equations. Um, only one year later, he posited what if all the matter were in a point? How would you solve Einstein's equations? And he saw right away that there was this boundary called the, at the Schwarzschild radius, which we now call the event horizon, where the force of gravity is so strong that even light can't escape. So even one year later, just that was 1915 was Einstein, 1916 is Schwarzschild, we already know that there's a one-way door out of our you know, causal experience. And that is also terrifying, because black holes are really the only thing they're the only knot that you can tie and then not untie, right? It's a one-way um, kind of formation of something. Now, the other thing that's interesting about Schwarzschild is that he did this in the front in World War I. I don't know about you, but I can't even operate without a cup of coffee in the morning. And, and there's the thought of sitting down and working out Einstein's equations while shells are bursting overhead just it boggles my mind. So these guys were made of really stern stuff. But we really didn't know that Einstein was onto something until Sir Arthur Eddington created this new kind of experiment. He said, well, during a, a total solar eclipse, the light bent by the gravity of the sun, by this gravitational well of the sun, should make stars appear to be offset from where they really are. Okay, so if we're here on the Earth, we would see the star here, but it's actually over here. And he led an expedition off the coast of Africa to Suriname. And he saw, indeed, the offset positions of these stars during a total solar eclipse were exactly what Einstein had predicted and not Newton. And overnight, Einstein became a household name. And Einstein's theory of gravity is what we use even to this day. So Einstein's theory is working well. But then the question is, so how do you make a black hole? Right? If you had a laboratory and you wanted to make a black hole, you'd have to crush things. Right? This table here, it's not going to surprise, hopefully, many of you to know that most of this is empty space. It's hard but the distance between the atoms is vast, right? It turns out that the sun, if you look at the density of the sun, it's about the density of water. There's nothing really crazy about that density, about one gram per cubic centimeter. It wasn't until people like Chandra Sekhar looked at white dwarves that we found that nature can squeeze all the space out of an atom till only the fundamental particles are left. And there's a star, Sirius B, which orbits around Sirius A, the dog star, which is the mass of our sun, but the size of the Earth. That's a white dwarf, and it's held up by quantum principles that prevent electrons from getting too close to each other. This is intensely dense stuff, right? It's 100, you know, million, 100, 100, uh, yeah, 100 million grams per cubic centimeter. So right away we understood that some of the things we're used to thinking about on Earth don't really hold in space, that there are crazy, extreme objects out in space. But even this is not a black hole. So how do we understand some of the extremes of matter? Well, our sun, not anytime soon, by the way, like we have a couple of billion years left, is going to turn into a white dwarf. Above the mass of our sun, you can get a neutron star, so even all the electrons and and protons inside the white dwarf can fuse together to be neutrons, you can get even denser. And that's a situation where you have a star that is the mass of our sun, but the size of New York or the size of Boston. One teaspoon of it weighs a trillion tons. Right? So it's hugely, hugely massive. But above that, people like Oppenheimer and Snyder in the 1930s worked out that even neutron star material, when there's enough material around it, cannot withstand the force of gravity. 
and those objects become black holes. So we have now a way for stars to become black holes. And those are the small black holes that Lisa was telling, about, uh, telling us about earlier. But there are also supermassive black holes, so the kind of black holes that exist in the center of that galaxy that I was showing you before. This is a different galaxy. This is M87 and the, in Virgo A. And you see a jet, like you saw before, coming from the nucleus of the galaxy. And when the Hubble Space Telescope looks at the gas right around the center of that galaxy, you see that there is a red-shifted part coming, or going away from us and a blue-shifted part coming towards us. And the only thing that can cause that orbital motion so close to the center of the galaxy has to be something that weighs about 7 billion times what our sun does. So again, very strong evidence that there are supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. And we understand this now because galaxies can merge over the lifetime of the universe and medium-sized black holes can turn into larger black holes and so on and so on and until you get billion solar mass black holes. So why do black holes glow? Right? We've, we've talked about you know, they're, they're the ultimate sinks, they're garbage disposals. The reason they glow, the reason in a paradox of their own gravity that they're some of the brightest things in the sky, is that they really efficiently turn gravitational potential energy into heat and light. They're really small, and they have huge attractive capability. So all the gas and dust around them are trying madly to get into a tiny, tiny volume. And just as when you rub your hands together to get warm, all the friction heats up that gas to hundreds of billions of degrees. So they shine very, very brightly. And this conversion can be 40% efficient. That's compared to a nuclear bomb or nuclear fusion, which is only about 1% efficient. So they're terrifyingly efficient engines for turning gravitational energy into radiant light. So that's why they glow. And this is what we think, oop, this is what we think the black hole, the emission around the black hole might look like. Oop, I'm gonna get that going for you. So this is a simulation done by someone who works in our group. Oop. Let's see if we can get it going. Well, maybe it's not gonna animate for us. Oh, there it goes. So this shows the swirl of gas uh, surrounding the black hole. And what you wind up seeing here, I want you to pay close attention to this, is this ring of light that seems stationary. It turns out that that marks the last orbit at which light can move around the black hole. Even light is bent by gravity. And even if you're traveling at the speed of light, you're forced onto this circular orbit around the black hole. And the reason you see this shadow is because much of the light that's emitted by the gas surrounding the black hole is lensed onto that last orbit. So you wind up seeing a ring with a relatively dim interior, and that's what we call the shadow. And Einstein, Einstein's equations predict the precise shape and size of that shadow. These are equations that he wrote 100 years ago. And this is what the Event Horizon Telescope is after. If we can measure this ring, if we can detect that size and that shape, we could test that Einstein's theories hold at the boundary of the black hole. And in the case of, some of, the, of a black hole that I'm about to show you, we would know that there were four million suns of mass inside of that ring. So the best candidate we have for a supermassive black hole that's near us, that we could resolve and make a picture of, is Sagittarius A star in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. It's about 25,000 light years away. This shows streamers of hot gas flowing into the center of our own galaxy, and this little white spot here is the point that marks a four million solar mass black hole. We know that because there's been some extraordinary work done by astronomers working in the infrared. They've looked at stars that emit in the infrared, and you can see that there's an unseen mass here that's tossing stars around like they were planets. This orbit in particular, SO2, is an 11-year orbit that has now been seen to go all the way around and close. What can cause a star to orbit it? like a planet does. It turns out that the mass of this unseen object here is four million solar masses. And this, this is extraordinary stuff. This, this knocked my socks off, and many other people's too. They were all sockless uh, it, when we saw this. So this was a real turning point, because this tightened the noose incredibly. And yet, we haven't seen a black hole, right? They're like dinosaurs, right? We, th we know they exist. We think they exist. But wouldn't it be great to see a picture of a dinosaur? Imagine you could see something like that. That's what we're after. So, you know, as they say in show business, so you want to, if 
photograph a black hole shadow? Well, you need the highest magnifying power ever assembled, right? Because the smallest size we can observe on the sky is equal to the wavelength of light you're observing divided by the size of your telescope. Standard, kind of simplest equation you can write for this kind of stuff. And the shadow size is 50 micro arc seconds. Let me decipher that. That's like seeing an orange on the moon. Or as, as Katie reminded me earlier this afternoon, it's like being able to hold a single atom at the end of your arm and see it. Right? So that's the kind of angular resolution. That's the magnifying power we need to conjure. But we also need to see Sagittarius A stars. We have to see through the Earth's atmosphere, the interstellar gas between us and the galactic center, and we also have to see through that 100 billion degree gas that's surrounding the black hole. And to do that, the only game in town really is our millimeter wavelengths, about a couple of hundred gigahertz, for those of you who think in frequency. So if we put into this equation here the wavelength of one millimeter, and the smallest size being 50 microarc seconds, which is the size of that ring, we come up with the size of the telescope being 10,000 kilometers. We have to build a 10,000 kilometer wide telescope. And since we're scientists and we kind of MacGyver things, that's what we do for a living, we just say, we're gonna do it. And we strap on our utility belt and we just get to work. Um, and that's what the Event Horizon Telescope really is all about. You can't build a single telescope that's the size of the Earth. Um, and the way these single telescopes work, is like a big radio dish, right? But it operates in the same way an optical does, is that light coming from the cosmos hits this perfectly defined parabolic surface. And the surface is tuned so that all the light gets reflected to this receiver. That's where you put your camera. And that's how a normal telescope works. But we need to make something that is 10,000 kilometers across. And the way we do that is with something called very long baseline interferometry, or AKA the secret sauce of the Event Horizon Telescope. What we do is we take radio telescopes that exist already in different parts of the Earth, and we look at the same object on the sky, and we record the light. We freeze the light at different points on the Earth, and we use an atomic clock to time tag it so we know exactly when the light rays from this black hole or this object hit that particular point on the globe. We record it on, it says magnetic tape. We used to do magnetic tape. We record on hard disks now. And we bring it together and compare it. This comparison is exactly the same operation as light bouncing off a surface and combining it to focus. But we do it in a supercomputer, what a mirror does just by its geometry. OK, so the name of the game is to record as much light as you can time tag it perfectly and compare it, and then you wind up getting a data set that's equivalent to having a telescope as large as the distance between these two dishes. And uh, what our group has done is work on the technology breakthroughs that have allowed this to happen. So instead of reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, we've developed these banks of hard disk drives, and we record many times the amount of data in the, in the Library of Congress every night that we observe. And instead of a bunch of analog electronics, we use these single chips here that do all of our signal processing for us that make the data ready and turn into ones and zeros that we can write onto these disks. And this has catapulted things. We've used Moore's law so that we have moved things of almost a factor of 100 uh, in terms of the data that we're recording at all these sites. Now, the first thing we did was we wanted to ask, can we see something the size of the event horizon? And so the first experiment that we did, we linked telescopes in Hawaii, Arizona, and California, and we looked at the center of our galaxy. And what we expected to see on this short baseline here, on the short distance between these two telescopes, remember it's lambda over d is the magnifying power, d is fairly short here, it's only 908 kilometers, that means you're looking at a big section of the sky. So if the emission around the black hole was finite in size, you would still get all of that emission Okay, th th this baseline would be sensitive to all of that emission. But on these long baselines, the magnifying power is so strong that you're looking at a much smaller part of the sky. So that if the emission region was this big, you're only looking at part of it. You'd only expect to get a fraction of the power. And that's exactly what we saw. Uh, this is the only graph, I think, that I'm going to show in this talk. But this is the power here, and it's the baseline length. It's the distance between the telescopes. On the California to Arizona baseline, we saw all of the power expected from this black hole. But on these long baselines, and this curve shows what we expected to see, you see much less power. And that's indicative of us 
resolving or seeing only a fraction of the energy from the black hole. We sized this black hole, we measured its extent, and it was about four Schwarzschild radii across, about exactly what we think the shadow should be. This is a, a, is a kind of aha moment that I wish everybody should experience in their life, no matter what field they're in. Because when we saw this graph, we put this together, we knew what we had to do for the next 20 years of our life, right? We had to continue on and go from a few telescopes to a much bigger array that now involves telescopes all over the world, including the South Pole. And when you get this many telescopes together with this kind of technique, you can move from simple size measurements to making a true image of the black hole. And that's what Katie is gonna talk about right now. All right, thanks Shep. So as Shep mentioned, there's many parts that go into uh, you know, getting this picture of the black hole, but kind of the last stage is taking the data and trying to make an image from it. So that's kind of what I, I'm gonna try to give you a, uh, uh, intuition of how we, how we do that. So um, remember that uh, Shep said that if we want to take a picture of the black hole in the center of our galaxy, given what we know, we would need to build this impossibly large Earth-sized telescope. So uh, let's for a second just imagine that we could build a telescope that is the size of the entire Earth. Um, a radio telescope, as Shep said, acts a lot like a mirror, or it is a mirror. And so light traveling from the black hole travels to Earth for 26,000 years, and eventually will get to Earth. And if we had a telescope dish like this, the size of the Earth, it would bounce off the dish and, and go to this focal point. Now, the key to making it possible to, uh, for an Earth-sized telescope to make a picture is that the light from the black hole would bounce off many locations and combine together at this, at this single location. And if we could do this, we could just start to make out the ring of light that is indicative of the event horizon of the black hole. So although this picture wouldn't look like you know, all the computer graphic renderings that we've been able to do, we'd be able to safely get our first glimpse of the immediate environment around a black hole. So clearly we can't build a telescope that is this large, but instead um, let's think of, uh, of a different way that we could do this. One way is let's try to put mirrors all over the entire Earth, essentially turning the Earth into a giant spinning disco ball. So in this case, the light would also travel from the black hole and reach, reach our disco ball Earth, and maybe at each little mirror we could collect the light, recording what we're seeing, and then instead of it all bouncing back to one place where it's combined, instead we combine it with a computer, all of the, all of the recorded light. And doing this, we're able to get an image that looks just like if we had a giant dish the size of the Earth. Okay, so by turning the Earth into this giant spinning disco ball, we can get measurements that can give us a picture that is just as good as the Earth-sized dish. But now let's imagine if we removed a, a lot of these mirrors, so only a few of them remain. Now there's a lot of holes, and we're only collecting light at a few locations. So these remaining mirrors represent the locations where the Event Horizon Telescope has telescopes. And using these measurements to make a picture is really hard because there's such few measurements. But luckily, as the Earth rotates, we get to see other new measurements. In other words, as that disco ball is spinning, the, mirror, the little mirrors change locations, and we get to see different parts of the, of the scene. So um, using the sparse data that we collect, the imaging algorithms that we develop fill in the missing gaps of the disco ball to, uh, reconstru to reconstruct the underlying black hole image. But you might look at this and be like, well, there's a lot of missing data. You know, how are we filling that in and making sure that we, that we believe the image that we get? And so to give you a kind of an idea of, of how we do that, I want to give this analogy where you can kind of think of the measurements that we, that we see from the telescopes a bit like notes in a song. So each measurement is like one tone of, or one note. And a different measurement that we take from the telescopes is a different note. So the image of the, of the black hole that we see with the Event Horizon Telescope is a little bit like listening to a song that's being played on a piano with a lot of broken keys. So although, you know, if, if 
uh, if you were to hear a song like this, it'd be kind of hard to make out what the song is, but a lot of times you'd still be able to get the general gist of it. And so just to make, make this a little bit more clear, I want to show you an example of as you add notes to a song, how, how, um, how you're able to kind of fill in the missing data yourself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a song, and I'm going to increase the number of notes that you hear, just like as we're increasing the number of telescopes in the Event Horizon Telescope Array. And hopefully, eventually, you'll start to kind of make out what the song is, or you'll at least get like the idea of, of, of the beat of the song, hopefully. <laughs> so um, I'll also light up the keys that, we're gonna, that, we're gonna be, that I'll be playing. So at first, there's only going to be one note playing. OK, so ready? By close to the end, uh, hopefully you were able to kind of get what the song was. And if you don't know the song, uh, Ice Ice Baby, then at least maybe you could kind of get the beat or, or kind of fill in the missing information that we had. And it's kind of really amazing that we're able to do that because there were a lot of notes missing there. But yet our brain, but despite that, our brain is able to fill in the missing information and we can kind of figure out what the song is. So no one is telling you that the notes that we weren't playing in uh, someone, like maybe someone could have just been banging on the notes that we weren't playing, and it would be a totally different song. But that's not a really reasonable way to put in, in the notes, um, to put in the missing information. And so you can kind of uh, um, figure out what the best um, song is. And, and what your brain is doing here is very much like what the imaging algorithms that uh, we developed for the Event Horizon Telescope are doing. You know, there are a, uh, a lot of possible images that can perfectly explain the telescope measurements that we make, but some of them are just more natural than other ones. But there is one thing I kind of want to bring your attention to, and that's that there is always some ambiguity to the measurements we're making. So no, even at the end when there was a number of notes playing and maybe a, a number of you knew what the song was, it didn't have to be Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby. It could have been you know, some other random combination of notes that were missing and a, just a completely different song. And the less notes that we see, the more ambiguity there is. So maybe at this point, Some of you even had confused it for queens under pressure. <laughs> so <laughs> if these were our measurements, we'd be in a bit of trouble. You know, there's two songs that fit the, the measurements fairly well, and so we can't make a good judgment on what it is. But to be fair, uh, you know, I chose this song um, for the reason of, that I wanted to kind of demonstrate um, that I wanted to demonstrate that there is this ambiguity. And this ambiguity also ex Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's uh, under pressure if you don't know it. <laughs> so, um, and I just wanted, uh, so this ambiguity exists in the measurements that we are, um, that we make with the Event Horizon Telescope. So similarly for the Event Horizon Telescope, the data we take only tells us a partial um, part of the story. Um, there's, a, there's still an infinite number of images that perfectly explain the telescope measurements that we make, but not all images are created equal, and some of those images look more like what we kind of think of as images than other ones. And so what we do is we rank images based upon how likely we think an image is, and then we choose the one that is most likely. So I'll come back to what this means a little bit later, but by using kind of this method, we can then um, make reconstructions of the data from the Event Horizon Telescope um, uh, that also match the, the data, that also look like reasonable images. 
So um, here I just uh, show you a simulation done using telescopes from um, using uh, simulations of telescopes from the Event Horizon Telescope Array when we pretend to point our, our telescopes towards the black hole in the center of the galaxy. And although this is just a simulation, reconstructions such as this um, uh, give us hope that we'll soon be able to reliably take the first picture of a black hole and also from it extract the size of that ring. But the question remains of how we actually define what a reasonable image is. What is a good black hole image? So let's take a step back. Instead, let's first say, well, how do we define what a likely Facebook image is? So many of us have experience with Facebook. We've seen what people post. And so we can try to um, look at an image and say, well, how likely would you see it on Facebook? So it's pretty unlikely someone would post this noise image on the left. And it's pretty likely that someone would post a selfie like this one on the right. The image in the center is blurry, so even though it's more likely than the noise image, it's probably less likely than the selfie. But when it comes to images from the black hole, we're posed with a real conundrum. We've never seen a black hole before, and in that case, what is a likely black hole image and what should we assume about the structure of black holes? We could try to define what a likely image is by looking at the simulations we've done, like the one Shep showed earlier, but if we did that, that could cause some really serious problems. What would happen if Einstein's theory didn't hold? We'd still want to reconstruct an accurate picture of what was going on. And if we bake those, those, those pictures and um, theories, the theory too much into our algorithms, we'll just end up seeing what we expect to see. In other words, we want to leave the option open for there being a giant elephant at the center of our galaxy. So what we do is develop algorithms that try to define what is a reasonable or likely image. And, the, and these need to define it in a way such that it's not so restrictive that it only tries to find something that we expect to see, like the black hole shadow, but also are able to get images kind of like the elephant in the center of the galaxy. But there are many ways that we can define what is a likely image. And so we, de we develop multiple algorithms that kind of try out all these different imaging assumptions. So for instance here, I might show you uh, three methods, one that th each one kind of defines what is a good image in different ways. So method one might say, OK, I like, I like blurry, kind of fluffy things. Um, those, those seem like things that I expect to see. Method two might say, I like images that, I've kind of, that have features of things I've seen before in this world and in space. And method three might say, I want an image that has really high contrast. So all these methods kind of have different assumptions on what an image looks like. But if given the same data, they all produce a very similar looking image with the same kind of structure, then we can start to become confident that the image assumptions we're making aren't biasing the picture of the black hole that much. However, in the case when one, when one or more of the algorithms produces an image that has a different structure, then that, that alerts us that there might be a problem. In this, case, the, the, in this case, often the data is not enough to constrain us. And so the image assumptions start to take over, and we can't really trust what we're seeing. But it's incredibly important to us that we're accurately representing the structure of the black hole that we're trying to image, and not just trying to make pretty pictures. So to make sure that these methods work, and to make sure that the, uh, the way that we can verify image works, We've been testing ourselves using something called the uh, Event Horizon Imaging Challenges. And the imaging challenges give us a way to test out the entire imaging pipeline before we have to do it for real just in a couple months. So in the, in the challenge, we have a team of people who, who selects an image and from it generates data that is very much like what we would expect to see from the Event Horizon Telescope. It has all the different kind of noise properties and everything, and then they make this data publicly available so that, you can, so that, um, so that people who have developed methods to be able to, uh, to take this data and make an image are able to uh, make an image from it. And these are many different methods with many different assumptions, and, and, uh, but all of these people do not have any access to the ground truth image. So they're just making their best guess at what they think the image is from the data that they see. 
And then we take this data, these images, and we send it to a panel of experts, some astrophysics experts. And we ask them, what do you think is real? And, and this is, uh, kind of simulates a little bit of the process of what we're actually going to have to do with the real data that we've collected. But differently from the real data we've collected, we also have the true image. So we also can compare how well our, imaging, our images match the actual true structure. So I kind of want, want to show you uh, a few examples of some results from the imaging challenge. So here you can take a look at it, um, one uh, such example. Here I show five images that were submitted from five different methods. And uh, well, the, the telescopes on, do not see color. So we only get grayscale images. But I'm going to show it in this other color map just so you can see a little bit more of the structure. Um, so before I show you the true image, I just want you to kind of think about a few questions. For instance, you know, what do you think is real here? What do you think is a real structure? Do you think that the images are consistent with each other? Do you have any guess to what the actual image is? So if I look at it, I actually think that the images look fairly consistent. There is a kind of ring structure, and it's kind of bright on one side. But one thing that I'm a little bit more concerned about and I'm not really sure of is that four of these methods, it's a, maybe a little hard to see, but four of them kind of have a tail coming off of the end. And one of them, it's missing. So if I see something like that where not all images are consistent, not all showing the same feature, I'm a lot, I'm a lot more skeptical of it. OK, so let's see what the real image is. OK, so actually, the, the algorithms seem to produce a pretty good image. They all kind of get that, that ring that we're seeing. Um, and even though all the images look quite different, for instance, this one kind of has very sharp edges. Um, uh, well, OK, the one on the, le uh, the left has very sharp images, and the other ones are a little bit more blurry. Um, then th they still all kind of get a very similar structure. OK, so um, how about one more example from the challenge? OK, so here is uh, from another um, set of data that we had where we used, where the people who were generating the data used a different image. OK, so I'll once again show it in this other color map. And again, ask yourself some questions. You know, what do you think this is? Do you have any idea? Uh, do they look similar? Uh, do you believe them? OK, so you guys ready? OK, well, uh, <laughs> we, this time, the image was actually Frosty the Snowman. So uh, although I don't think anyone expects us to have a huge, giant snowman at the center of our galaxy, I think this was a really fruitful exercise. Because, um, because although no, this is not expected, we want to be able to have our algorithms be flexible enough to actually see something that is unexpected, like the elephant in the center of our galaxy or the snowman. And I'm really happy that the algorithms, even though they're not usually tested on images like this, still are able to to get the general structure of the snowman, and even in some cases get the, the little arms. <laughs> um, so yeah, as Shep mentioned, um, earlier this month, actually, we took the first measurements from the Event Horizon Telescope that we'll actually possibly be able to make an image from. So I'm really excited for us to be able to get this data um, very soon, get our hands dirty, and start making these images. And hopefully, as our imaging algorithms progress, we may even be able to start making videos from them. So these imaging algorithms will hopefully make it possible for us to test Einstein's famous equations, for which scientists rely on a daily basis, and hopefully learn more about the dynamics around a black hole. All right, uh, I think Shep uh, wants to say a little bit of something about, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, while we're both up here, it, it's really important to understand that you know, these are now two pieces of the whole project, right? I've walked you through black holes and some of the fundamental principles of the Event Horizon Telescope, how two telescopes can act as a telescope the size of the distance between them. And then Katie showed us you know, very intuitively how you take many, many telescopes and synthesize an image. And it's all kind of academic, isn't it? You know, can we do it? Can we not do it? 
And again, I want to show you that we have many, many telescopes now in the Event Horizon project. And as Katie said, last month, after a 10-year preparation period, we took our first data that involved really this, um, oh, we have, oh, there it is, uh, which involved this center uh, array in Chile. It's that cluster of telescopes in there. And that increased our sensitivity by a factor of 10. So imagine all of a sudden you could see things times 10, right? So the earlier work that we've done is now greatly amplified. And we really think that we have a, a very good shot at making the first image of the, event of, of the event horizon. And that is quite extraordinary. It's a really interesting place and time to be in the project. And I wanted to say, tell you that uh, the whole team is really excited. So we have people here at the South Pole that are getting the telescope ready there. Uh, we had people in Mexico working on atomic clocks. Uh, these, these atomic clocks only lose one second every 100 million years, so they're very precision instruments, and they have to be at every single one of these sites, right? And you've never, your heart hasn't skipped a beat until you've winched one of these atomic <laughs> clocks up a helical staircase at 15,000 feet. That really, really gets you going. And these are uh, some people also in Mexico. Uh, these are people down in Chile. These are our, our colleagues in Spain. Uh, these are some people up at the top of Mauna Kea, uh, the highest uh, mountain in uh, the Hawaiian chain. So it's really uh, hats off to these people and to the whole team. And we're just, represent we're just two representatives of the team. And we think we're very, very close to it. So stay tuned. And, um, and we hope to have something to show you in the near future. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, again, it is some, somewhat academic, so I think we're going to sit and chat for a minute, um, Katie and I, just to give you a little sense of, uh, of the human element of this. And, and the reason is that uh, Katie was at a remote site during part of the uh, experiment that we ran in early April, and I was at a central command facility here, a central command, a bunker uh, at, at Harvard, <laughs> right? Harvard has bunkers. And uh, we were uh, there, not underground, on the second floor. And, uh, and so we had different experiences. And we're just now actually one of the first times we're seeing each other after this, all this activity. So um, I want to start off by, by asking you, uh, Katie, uh, to explain to me and, and to us, well, how did you get into this, this field? Because you know, I, I know how I got into it, but why don't you say a few words about how you got into it? Or do you want me to go sure. first? Sure. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Yeah, so um, I actually um, come at this. I'm not an astronomer. Uh, I actually um, had the great opportunity to work on this um, because I got in touch through um, my advisor, who uh, we do computer vision. And so I work at MIT. I'm a PhD student um, who studies computer vision. So I, really, I work with pixels and trying to understand what's going on in images. And uh, I think. Uh, uh, well, I had the opportunity to kind of travel up to Haystack Observatory, I don't know, three years ago, <laughs> or uh, four, a uh, uh, long time ago, I guess. And, and now. The, so so now. I should say Haystack Observatory is where that supercomputer is that merges all the data from all the sites of the Event Horizon Telescope. So that's kind of you know, a central node for us, and we make pilgrimages there. Yeah. <laughs> we, you know, burnt, burnt offerings are, are brought, and chocolate is always useful there. <laughs> So um, yeah, I got uh, you know at the time I knew n you know nothing about black holes, but I was like heard that there's a project that maybe could use an imaging person, and so obviously I jumped on the opportunity. <laughs> you know you don't uh, um, in computer science we don't often get the opportunity to work with black holes, um, and so uh, I went up there and it was just um, Shep and others there just described this really cool project, and um, I left understanding about 10% of what they said, if, if that, but knowing that I really wanted to work on this project. And you know, at the time, I didn't really um, know too much about it. Uh, but I kind of started reading about it and everything. And I, I started re realizing that actually the problems, even though you know, it all centers around all these black holes, uh, uh, everything about black holes and stuff, but really, it's not that different from a lot of the problems that we um, deal with in computer vision and in image processing. Um, you know, we have this data, this really, really noisy data, sparse data, and we want to um, try to get out something from it. And these are problems that I kind of work on all the time. 
in, um, in, our, in our field. And, uh, you know, for instance, a medical imaging, you know, when you go and get your, an MRI of your brain or something to, to figure out if something is going wrong, it uses a lot of the same ideas that we're using to take an image of a black hole. So it's really not that different. But I was just, I'm so glad that I was able to, you know, work my way in and, and try to, you know, have a, a, small, a small contribution to, this, uh, to the project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and, and don't let her fool you, Katie is uh, contributing mightily to the project, right? She, she runs the entire Event Horizon Telescope Imaging Challenge, which is really uh, an incredible feat. And so for, for my part, um, I got into this, I wasn't a boy astronomer, you know, so some people grind their own lenses and they make their own telescopes and, <laughs> they, you know, they want jet packs, you know, and, and, um, and I came to this late in the game, and when I graduated from undergraduate, I saw this flyer and it said, do you want to go to Antarctica? <laughs> Is there any other response than yes? You know? <laughs> and, and so I sent this application in and, uh, and I was interviewed and they said, you're hired. You know? And I said, great, what do I get to do? Like, well, we're gonna send you there for a year. You know? And you can't leave, right? But that was one of the, probably the best thing that ever happened to me you know, professionally. Uh, I, was, I was quite young, and I spent a year on the coast of Antarctica and took care of a lot of experiments, because that's where the magnetic field lines come down and they pierce the, the Earth's skin. And so there's a lot of interesting phenomena to study there. And I was put in charge of all these experiments. And there's no radio shack you know, down the road. There's no drones from Amazon you know, coming in there. Uh, if something breaks, you have to fix it. So you get really good with duct tape. Uh, you get really good with you know, binder twine and pliers. And there was a real joy in doing science in difficult circumstances. And that is what does it for me, right? Uh, I'm not a computer vision person, but I absolutely am in love with going to the telescopes to 15,000 feet and doing things that nobody's done before. Uh, so that, that's my, you know, that's my uh, tie into this. And then the, the, other, the other thing that we were thinking about was, um, was a different role. So as I said, I was in a central command facility here, and, and Katie, you were at the, at the large millimeter telescope. So what was that like? I've, I've been to the LMT, but what was it like yeah. this time uh, to yeah. make the observations there? Uh, well, and and yeah. that's this telescope, that's yeah. the center so. one there with the atomic clock. So we had a, a big team of people at the large millimeter telescope. So uh, um, as Shep said, um, at, at, you know, we, there was a groups of people who traveled to every site. So we had people at the South Pole, people, you know, Hawaii and um, Arizona, and I, I was lucky enough to get to go to Mexico. Um, and so um, the Large Millimeter Telescope is situated at about 15,000 feet. So we're, we work up there all day. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit draining because you have, a, a, um, you know, not as much oxygen up there. But uh, it's a lot of, uh, a huge amount of fun. So, uh, you know, as I, as I said, I don't really, I originally didn't have much experience with telescopes, but I did kind of was interested in the imaging side of things. But one thing that I think is really important for the imaging is trying to understand exactly, you know, what the data is, where it comes from, what kind of noise enters the pro process. And I think all these kind of things, and as I've, started working, as I work more with the team and I've gotten to spend more time at the telescope there, I get to learn a lot of this kind of stuff that I don't get just by looking at the theory, the theory of it here <laughs> in Cambridge. So um, it's really cool. Uh, I, so my role, I guess, at the telescope was, um, I, I was helping mostly with taking the, uh, the, the light, I guess, and digitizing it onto those hard drives so that we could then fly it back um, here to kind of treat to to process it like we kind of saw the the light all at the same time mm -hmm. from all the different locations. Um, so it was it was pretty cool. We um, we we had to um, I guess a lot of times we have to do the observations at night. So we we had to s switch our schedule. So we're sleeping during the day. Unfortunately, the gas truck <laughs> and all the roosters crowing and stuff kind of keep you awake then. But then uh, uh, we'd, go, we'd go up at night and we'd, uh, we'd, we'd take the measurements then. Mm. So how was uh, um, the central command? I know yeah. that I used you guys a lot <laughs> when yeah. I was at the LMP. It was a little different. 
it, we, the, the central command form because there are problems in the field, right? So you get these emergency calls, right? <laughs> so all of a sudden a recorder isn't working. And these recorders are vital, right? We're recording 32 gigabits per second at every one of these sites. So we record almost a petabyte of data, or a thousand terabytes of data at each one of these telescopes. No internet could ever send that back. It would take about 40, 40 days, two months, just to send it back constantly. Uh, from the South Pole, where we only get 50 gigabytes uh, per day allotment of data, it would take us 24 years <laughs> to get that data back, right? Uh, so the fastest thing that you can do is load up a 747 with disk drives. No internet beats that. Right? So we, we use FedEx, and FedEx is, it turns out, uh, the best thing that ever happened to radio astronomy. <laughs> so, so one thing that we do is, at the Central Command, is we're the clearinghouse. So we are 24-7 open. We have lines of communication open to all the sites, LMT included. And whenever somebody had a problem, we would route that problem to the local expert who was at sea level, who was rested, who had just eaten a nice steak sub, you know, who was just like happy to sit in front of a computer and help somebody remotely. And, and that's really important because at the, at the sites, you get what you call summit moments, right? I don't know if you guys know what that means, but when you're at 14,000 feet, there's not enough oxygen, and you start getting loopy. And I really do mean loopy. And I remember <laughs> standing on a ladder once trying to screw something in, and people are down below me saying, will you please hurry up? And I'm saying, I'm really working on it here. And it was only after about a minute that I realized I was unscrewing this thing, right? I was just the wrong direction, right? And you just, that, that just happens up there. So uh, you need somebody at sea level, and that was what we were doing at the Central Command. And the, the big thing for us was making the go, no-go decision. Because when you think about it, you need, the weather good, you need the weather to be good everywhere across the array. So normally when you do astronomy, it's enough to have one telescope with good weather. We need eight telescopes with good, with good weather. And Sometimes you're left watching a cloud or a big mass of water vapor drift towards your telescope, and you're just, is it going to pass? You know, is it, <laughs> is it going to hang out over my telescope? Is it going to form ice on the dish and make, make it shut down? And you make a call, go or no go, and those are the most agonizing things we do in the entire project, frankly. You know, if, if, you, may, if you say go and then the, the weather closes in and it's horrible, you've wasted a night. And the most precious thing we have is time, because these telescopes we use are oversubscribed typically by a factor of 10 to 1. And you have to compete like mad to get that time. So if you lose and you, if you waste a whole night, that's really gold. And you feel as bad, frankly, when, um, when you say don't go and the weather's beautiful, <laughs> right? Because you've just wasted you know, some time there. So th th that, was the, that was the general difference between being in a remote site and I think being in the central, central bunker. I wouldn't say you guys were so well rested though. We woke you up plenty of times at like 3 a.m. <laughs> asking That's really questions. True. That's really true. In fact, once I woke somebody up in Holland because they were the local expert on this piece of equipment and he was not really prepared for it. And he said, well, I've left my password at work. You know? <laughs> And I was like, we've waited a decade for this, buddy. You get to work, you know? Like, you, know you, you get your bicycle or whatever, and you, you, like, you, know, you bike to your Dutch um, place of work, and you uh, figure out what that password is, and you use it. Um, and so, so speaking of which, you know, we, we've talked about our, our, the different ways in which we join this. And, and by the way, you know, if you ask a bunch of kindergartners what they want to be when they grow up, it's, it's all like ballerinas and, 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 and doctors, I guess, and firemen and stuff. Nobody ever says, oh, I want to image a black hole when I get older, right? So the, the paths we've taken really uh, illustrate the different ways you wind up kind of at the same place. The, the last thing I wanted to add is that there's been some talk you know, recently politically about the difficulty of ideas and people moving across borders and, uh, and intellectual freedom. And, and what I love about this project is that it elegantly sidesteps all of that, right? It just simply and straightforwardly gets a bunch of scientists together, united by a common vision to see the unseeable, to test Einstein's theory at the black hole boundary. And it uses allocated resources from around the globe in a very interesting, innovative way to create a new kind of instrument that no one country can own, clearly, but that all countries can contribute to. 
And it's the free flow of scientific ideas across borders that make it possible. And it's really the free flow of people, too. Um, so we just do our business, and uh, we are creating something with this global community and this global team that I think is very special. So it's a real privilege to work with the whole team. So do we want to do anything else before we open up to questions? Good. We are at your disposal. <laughs> All right, so please wait, and if you have a question, raise your hand, and one of us will come and bring a microphone over to you. So we'll have the first question right over here. Um, it sounds like you guys are already getting started with, um, with trying to get a picture of the black hole. Um, when you guys, do you guys have an expectation of when um, the, the first time you, you would actually be able to definitively see that, see that ring, or is that something that um, is not uh, planned out yet? I, I would say that we're probably a year out, you know, to, to give you a real idea, because we have to bring the data together, and the disk drives are just still arriving at the two supercomputer centers where they're going to be processed. One is in Bonn, Germany, and one is in Haystack Observatory, about 40 miles north of where we're sitting now. And I don't think I'm breaking confidentiality to say that we have some very interesting and good news so far. I mean, it looks like the Event Horizon Telescope did work, right? So it's, I mean, this technique is horribly nerve-wracking, right? It's the ultimate in delayed gratification. You don't even know if your telescope worked until all the data come back, right? And so now we're just getting the first inklings that the telescope worked and that it worked spectacularly well. So we have every indication, and we're optimistic, that we'll be able to use the, the techniques that Katie was, was talking about with this new and, and very unique set of data. A year. So a two-part question. One is when you're using telescopes, different positioning of it based on the movement of the Earth, you're obviously getting those images or the data for those images at different times. So they're not all synchronized. So how do you take that into account? Do you just assume a relatively constant image and, and try to patch it in that way? And the second part of the question is, how many different frequencies can you use? I mean, not just different colors of light, but across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, how much more information do you get by doing that, or are you not able to do that? Do you want, I, I can, yeah. And then maybe Shep can add on at the end. So yeah, you're, you're exactly right. As the Earth is rotating, um, you know, we're getting measurements. So if there is a lot of motion in the, in the black hole, then we're basically kind of getting data from different snapshots, different frames of a movie. And so, yes, usually in um, these algorithms, we assume that uh, the black hole is pretty static. And this is a pretty good assumption in a lot of cases. For instance, we're not just interested in the black hole in the center of our galaxy, but also the one um, Shep showed in the um, center of M87. And um, depending on, um, so M87, we think that the uh, black hole there is very kind of static, and it doesn't change too much over the course of a night. So this is a reasonable assumption. But for Sagittarius A star, which is in the center of our own galaxy, and we actually think it evolves over the course of minutes. And so we do have to kind of take that into account. And so that's why, you know, the next stage, right now we kind of assume static images, and um, but the next stage is to try to, um, uh, even you know, improve these imaging algorithms, so maybe we even can make movies from them and see the dynamics um, over time. Um, you know, it's already hard enough to make an image, so you're increase, you're, you have so much more information you're trying to fill in for a movie. But I think that you know, if you model it that way, you you could get some, we could get some rich information out. And as far as uh, frequencies, yes, I think there are, but um, maybe I'll, Shep will. Maybe you want to talk about that about the three. Yeah. Well, so we're 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 basically digesting and capturing uh, about uh, 16 gigahertz of data. Okay, that, that's, uh, I'll tell you what that means in a moment. It's a, it's a slice of frequency, and we're at 200 gigahertz. So the fraction of the frequency spectrum that we're capturing is really tiny compared to the frequency. So it, it's almost monochromatic. It's almost as though you're looking at one frequency of light. Okay, And we can get 
more sensitivity by increasing that bandwidth, right? So we can use Moore's law, the same kind of, of law that lets your, super, your the computer on your desktop run faster. We use commodity off-the-shelf pieces of equipment to build our systems, right? People used to build these by hand, like with hand tool them, like leather, right? I mean, they used to make these immensely complicated analog systems or hand design them or forge new kinds of integrated circuit chips to do it. Now we just go to Newegg, you know, and we go to Amazon and we order these things off the shelf and we wire them together and it's the sheer raw computing power of commodity electronics that has let the EHT do what it does now. So we, 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 we maintain the radio waves because those are the ones that can see all the way through to the center of the galaxy. You could never do this, let's say, in optical light for a number of different reasons, one of which is you just can't see to the center of the galaxy. So we, uh, the, the, this is kind of, it's kind of a Goldilocks problem. Millimeter wave radiation, radio waves, can see deep into the gravity well. And through all the interstellar medium, all the dreck between us and the galactic center, and through our Earth's atmosphere, and they just happen to be what we need to make an Earth-sized telescope with the magnifying power that can see what we're after. It's, sometimes nature is crazy, but sometimes she's kind. Great. We have the next question in the back of the house to your left. Hi. Oh. Hello. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, uh, what is the typical exposure time for like an observational run on any of those telescopes to like actually get inf enough data to like reconstruct images? Um, yeah, so uh, this observation uh, run that we did just a couple weeks ago, um, we observed over five nights, and each night was, uh, well, most nights were 16 hours. <laughs> so actually, so, um, so kind of, you know, as the Earth is rotating for 16 hours. And the reason we don't do the full, you know, 24 hours is because um, the, the radio telescopes work best uh, it, uh, when, when it's dark out, when the temperature is constant and the dish doesn't kind of warp due to the sun being on it. So the, if, the, if there's, uh, you know, the sun is beating down on it, the dish kind of warps and it kind of, you know, just m makes your picture out of focus and everything. And so, but 16 hours was a, actually quite a long time. And so for us at the large millimeter telescope, because we're up at such high altitude, we can't be there for that long. So we actually would split our team into two teams. And, um, and so I was in the second team, so I'd go up around midnight and, and come back around 12 p.m. There was another team that would go up around 4 p.m. and come down around 2 a.m. So, but we, but over, but, Basically, five nights of 16 hours is what we did this, this year. Do you want any, to add anything to that? No, it's a, it's a great question. You're, we're limited by the time. And what I will say is that we reserved four nights. And at the end of four nights, we tallied up some of the lost time because it's inevitable. Some of the recorders don't work. Uh, sometimes one of the telescopes has a technical problem. You know, something can freeze up and you lose a little bit of time. And we were really fortunate because uh, I was able to call up some of the directors of the telescopes and explain the situation. And uh, they wound up giving us some extra time uh, to do that, so to make up for the lost time and to give us the full exposure, if you will, that the Event Horizon Telescope wanted. And, and that, was, that was really wonderful to get. And uh, it made all the difference because the last day, it could have been our best day, best night. Next question in the front row to your left. Why is it so crucial to prove Einstein's theory near black holes? Mm. <laughs> Can I please take that one? Yeah. Yeah. What a wonderful <laughs> question that is. So, you know, Feynman said the test of all theory is experiment, right? I mean, you always want to push the theories that you rely on to the extreme. You always want to see where they break. So for hundreds of years, Newton's theory of gravity was fine. It governed the trajectory of like, cannonball shells or dropping apples and things like that. It's only when you pushed it and you looked at things like the perihelion of Mercury or, or other things that were not really understood that you saw that there was a problem, right? So where are you going to find a problem? You go to laboratories of extremes that are given to you by nature, right? You go to neutron stars where magnetic fields are you know, insanely more strong than they are here on Earth, right, to test certain things. 
And where do you go to test Einstein's theory of gravity? Where gravity is the dominant force at the edge of a black hole. That's where we may see some deviation from Einstein's theory. And, and it's important, I, I want to say, say this, this is very important to say for, for me. If you had asked Einstein what good his theory was in 1915, what could he possibly have said, right? I mean, there were horse-drawn carriages in the streets, right? You know, there were no refrigerators, you know. It was, it was a different time. And here he was thinking about the geometry of space-time. He would have said, there is absolutely no application I can see. And yet we use it every day today. Without Einstein's corrections to gravity, GPS doesn't work, right? If you, if, if you didn't make the Einstein general relativistic corrections in GPS, you'd be off by miles. So sometimes you have got to wait 100 years to see if something's useful, but it's worth it. Great. We have the next question right here in the front. Uh, thanks again for the dual presentations. I would like to ask a question about possible future actions. And this is based on the fact that, according to my understanding, all of your observations are based on our own galaxy. And there's one black hole in our galaxy, maybe. But I would assume that every galaxy has a black hole. And there are about 10 to the 10th galaxies, or 10 to the 11th. And I wanted to know what is the potential, not in the immediate future, but arranging for some kind of observer observatory equipment to be placed on other, in other galaxies, and would that be expected to yield an advantage over what we can do working on one galaxy? Go ahead. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll take this, and maybe Kitty wants to expand on it. That's a fantastic point. And what I would say is that uh, the Event Horizon Telescope is, is, is a visionary project. And 10 years ago, I would have been hard-pressed to say that we could actually pull this off. And now I think we're quite close to, to doing just that. And, and now that we're close to doing that, we're thinking exactly along the lines that you've described. What's next? What's the next step? Uh, you, yes, we're looking at the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Yes, we're looking at M87 in the center of Virgo A, which is a, a thousand times more massive, right? So it's a different, it's a, it's a different beast altogether, right? Because it's in a different galaxy. And, and the next step is to increase our magnifying power even more, right? We're totally unsatisfied as scientists, right? So one of the ways we can do that is by increasing the frequency at which we observe. That's really hard. You need to develop new electronics, more stable atomic clocks, you know, so there's, there's definitely a path forward to increase your magnifying power just by increasing the frequency. And then we're excited to think now about putting a telescope in space, right? How do you, how do you leave the surface of the Earth, right? Everything I've, that we've both said gives you a magnifying power if you're limited to the surface of the Earth. But what if you put something in orbit? Then the baseline becomes from the surface of the Earth to this other spacecraft. Now you're looking at something that has a much bigger lever arm, and you can see even finer structures. That will likely bring other sources into range for doing the kind of work that we describe. Okay, well, I'd just like to comment. I think you should be optimistic, because from my limited knowledge of the history of science, major technical advances are being made regularly and without great time intervals between them. I, I concur. Last question in the front row to your left. Who is funding this project, and is there any chance that the current administration could cut your funds? Is this being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well so, so first of all, it's a, it's a real delight and, and a pleasure uh, to report that by, both Katie and I receive funding from the National Science Foundation. Uh, which has backed this project for, for a number of years. Uh, we have to submit funding proposals each year, and if they're found with merit, then we receive the funding. So it's not just, um, we're, we're very responsible and excellent stewards of the federal dollar. I really do feel that way. And, and we don't go to the National Science Foundation to ask for the next tranche of funding until we have something to show for it. That's really you know, how we roll in this project. Um, th that being said, we have also been very, very fortunate uh, to get support 
uh, from the John Templeton Foundation and also from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Uh, who ha and they've been instrumental because they've backed us to do the kind of visionary, uh, out-of-the-box thinking that is paving the way for the future of the Event Horizon Telescope and, and to get the job done now. It's the combination of this private funding um, through very generous foundations and benefactors and the National Science Foundation that's, that's uh, brought us to where we are now. I really have no comment on the current administration um, and the, whether or not our funding might be cut other than the fact that I think we're just doing really good stuff. And I think that if you're doing really good stuff and you have a good team, um, that shows and people will invest in it. Well, that was fascinating and really wonderful to hear. You know, intellectual freedom, science crossing borders and eliminating boundaries. And we only have to wait another year to find out if there's a snowman or an <laughs> elephant or something else and what it looks like. So it's very exciting, your work, and thank you so much for coming to share with us where you are. We'll have to have you back in a year so we can see the images. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>